Ideas in STEM Ed is a production of the Idea Engineering Student Center at UC San Diego, which works to promote community, success, and inclusion at all levels. My name is Darren Lapomi, Professor of Nanoengineering and Chemical Engineering and Faculty Director of the Idea Center. The purpose of this podcast is to provide a forum for the discussion of innovative and inclusive approaches to teaching and mentoring, and to support the personal and academic flourishing and success of students in science and engineering. To learn more about the Idea Center, visit jacobschool.ucsd.edu front slash idea. I'm speaking today with Professor Todd Pascal, who is a professor of nanoengineering and chemical engineering at UCSD. Actually, his office is about 20 feet away, <laughs> two doors down. Um, but we're both COVID negative, so we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna try. We're gonna try to do this. <laughs> okay, so um, I could introduce you some more, but yeah. I think it's better that that you do it. Sure. So, uh, so Todd, where did you grow up? So, so I am. Um, so I'm an island boy. So I grew up in um, in Grenada. It's this. Um, we like to call it a, a small, big con- um, little island in the South Caribbean. So, to kind of get your bearings straight, you, if you sort of go to Venezuela and South America, directly north of that is Trinidad and Tobago. Most people have heard of that island, um, that twin island, actually. And just a little bit north of that, maybe about 50 miles north of um, uh, Tobago, is Grenada. And to the east of Grenada is Barbados, which, again, so most people would have heard of. And to the north of it is this island called St. Vincent, uh, and then St. Lucia, and then Dominica. So um, so Grenada, St. Vincent, um, St. Lucia, and Dominica are sort of four islands that comprise sort of the Eastern Caribbean. Um, and they have uh, uh, sort of financial ties and, um, and sort of uh, the, the people are more or less um, the same. So the history of the Caribbean is, it was named after this, um, this tribe of people who left South America and in, in canoes and sort of traveled up the islands. Um, uh, the ones that ended up in the sort of southern Caribbean islands were the Caribs, and hence the Caribbeans. Um, they were in hot pursuit of another uh, set of peoples who were called the Arawaks, and they mostly settled the northern um, islands because the, well, lore will have it, the Arawaks were the peace-loving, sort of fun ones, and then the Caribs were sort of the aggressive uh, ones who were just chasing the Arawaks. Yeah, Ar- Ar- Arawaks and... Uh, the Virgin Islands yeah. and Puerto Rico. Exactly. Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, the Bahamas, um, parts of Cuba um, as well. So so I grew up, so Grenada is, 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 is pretty small. It's about 120 odd um, square miles, maybe. Um, so 10 by 10, 11 by 11, pretty small. Island. 100 UCSDs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, about maybe about two and a half UCSDs in population. So the total population of the island has stayed remarkably the same for um, 40 years. It's about you know, 95 to 100,000 people. Um, and a lot of that is just because people like me leave. <laughs> <laughs> so how does a boy become interested in material science? Yeah, it's, so it's, it's an interesting thing because we... Um, the it, it's still on there. It, it was a British colony. There was a lot of infighting between the Brits and the, the French. Um, so about half of the island is named has French names. So I grew up in this little village uh, called Boucherjou, a beautiful bay in French. And um, and my you know my family had for for what we can tell, my family had been there for maybe about a hundred years. Uh, it was extremely tiny village, maybe about 100 people. So I probably was uh, somehow related to just about every one of them. <laughs> and they let me know it <laughs> whenever, uh, whenever we go back. So um, so it's under the British system. Um, the Brits were sort of the, the last uh, colonial power there. And so the schooling system was, was very much a British. So I went to primary school and then secondary school and all of that. And I would say the first time that I seriously got interested in science. I mean, I always, um, I was, I had a pretty good aptitude in math. I was pretty good at that. I, I knew all of my, you know, 
multiplication tables when I was really, really young. And, um, and the teachers generally were supportive of me, um, you know, being uh, sort of uh, partaking what they considered the hardest thing to do, which was science. And so they were like, yeah, maybe you should do you know, chemistry or something because you seem like you might be uh, pretty decent at that. And when I was in secondary school, which is equivalent of high school, um, I had a, an amazing science teacher. He was both my physics and chemistry teacher at the same time. And that was, you know, when um, he was uh, he was not my biology teacher and I hated biology because it, uh, it was presented to us that you just need to remember all these things. Mm-hmm. And I have and still to this day a terrible memory. So I was really bad at biology, but I was good at physics because, you know, there's a lot of math and I could figure things out. And, and um, so I, I don't know if I became interested in materials until I came to the U.S. I, I sort of, um, the the way that it works in uh, under the British system is that when you are about 16, you graduate high school, you know, secondary school. And so when I turned 16, I graduated. Um, and then came up to the U.S. And it was a little bit early for me to go to college. And so my dad, uh, in his now infinite wisdom, I thought it was a complete disaster at the time. But um, in his now infinite wisdom, he says, well, maybe you should do an extra year of U.S. high school because you haven't you know, done anything. But he's a computer scientist. He right? is a computer scientist. Yeah. So he came up to the States, actually, um, when I was really young. I, I'm, he must have left when I was about three years old. And he came up to... Uh, attend university and he went to Texas Southern University in Houston and he's still to this day in Houston, mission in computer science and, and did that. And, um, and he returned about 10 years later, I would say, um, he'd, uh, gotten a master's in computer um, engineering, computer science, came back. And so I was just starting, um, secondary school and he came back for those years and he bought back with him all of his college textbooks. And so, um, so he tells the story and he bought a computer back. So he tells the story of, um, the first time he sort of caught me. I mean, I had done, I had been messing around with this computer way before he, uh, he caught me for the first time. But the first time he, he actively knew that I was uh, fooling around with the computer, he's, um, he had went out and I was up, you know, playing with the computer until maybe about 4 a.m. <laughs> and, uh, and then he came back and he was like, what are you doing? And I was just sort of glued to the machine. And um, I remember vividly that, that first experience because, um, you know, back then, you know, you interacted with the computer primarily through the command prompt. You type commands and then things will happen. Um, and so I was, you know, I would be trying to communicate with the computer and ask it questions like, you know, what color is the sky? <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> I thought that this was this oracle that knew everything, <laughs> and um, and then it will reply back invalid command, <laughs> and so I spend the entire night trying as you know my hardest to actually give it a valid command. That was my one main goal. Do you remember the specs on this computer? Oh, it, I want to compare your first. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I mean, it was the size of probably your desk. <laughs> And, you know, it, it was running at that time. I mean, goodness me, I, I, I couldn't even begin to tell you. I, I think it was running some, like, Windows 3.1 or something. Like okay, that. well, that's, that's <laughs> fairly, fairly <laughs> um, Yeah. Were we born in similar years? 1983, I was born. Yeah, yeah, I was 83 as well. Yeah, so um, um, I feel a certain kinship with people <laughs> born in 1983. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's it was... Um, you know, just goodness. I yeah, I couldn't tell you the specs. I, I should ask my dad. He probably, he probably still has that. <laughs> He's uh, he collects, he collects them. No. So your dad caught you, and what were you? So you were you were asking the Oracle of Zelphi. <laughs> well, what, you know, I try anything that I could ask it. Um, you know, because uh, you know how old am I? I mean, I was just asking it anything that I thought would be that it would know, and it, of course, it couldn't. And um, answer. Um, and I actually don't think I, I ever got it at that time, that first, that time that my dad caught me. I don't think it ever, I ever got it to, to tell me, to, I didn't ever give it a, a valid command so that it would do something. It was everything that I tried, it was invalid command. And it was, it was frustrating, but it was also quite annoying because I was like, you're a machine. How dare you tell me invalid <laughs> command? <laughs> yeah. So, so my, my goal in life then was to figure out how to, how to give it a valid command. And, 
Um, and so my dad, um, you know, he uh, chuckled to himself. Um, and then he, he gave me one of his sort of programming textbooks. And he says to me, um, he's like, you should probably learn this language. It's our namesake. It was Pascal. So he's like, you should. <laughs> <laughs> so you should, like, you should probably learn this computer language. And then you'll figure out how to, how to ask invalid questions. So, so that was my first entry. And I was... 11, 11 years old and um, learning Pascal, learning back then there was a computing language called BASIC um, um, and I, I learned that and then, um, and then QBASIC? I, QBASIC, yeah. Gorillas and Nibble. Exactly, yeah. And I programmed and, them. And, and yeah. deconstructing them to figure out how they work. <laughs> so so that was fun. I mean, it was, you know, it, I, I did a lot of fun things like try to code Nibbles and code Pac-Man um, when I got a little bit better. Um, but I, I just had a knack for that stuff. Mm -hmm. It just, it just came to me, you know? Um, and so I, I devoured his textbooks. I sort of, I learned C, um, and, you know, and I was coding these, you know, very simplistic sort of programs, but, you know, and, and, um, but it was, it was, it was fun because it, it presented a different way of approaching languages. So again, I, I was, I had such a terrible memory um, that I relied, overly relied on sort of my analytic skills. And so that's how that developed sort of this, this need to be useful because I couldn't remember most things. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, um, so then I, I ended up becoming really, really interested in just how far can we push this, right? So there's this machine that you can give commands and, I realized quite quickly that it, it actually is a, a relatively simple machine. I mean, it, there are these really complicated processes that are going on in the background, but at its core, it's this kind of, you know, input output sort of thing, right? You tell it what to do and then response. Mm -hmm. And then my dad said to me, um, you know, he's like, well, it can do a little bit more than that. I mean, it's, you know, if you connect, it turns out that he's, uh, this is right at the beginning of the World Wide Web. Um, and we did actually did not have a connection to the internet um, then, and we'd I'd have to go to the library to to actually see this in action. But um, and then he was like, "Well, if you connect them together, it turns out that you know this relatively simple machine that's sitting on your desk, if it ends up getting networked with a whole bunch of other machines, then you really start um, harnessing some incredible power in it." And and so this idea of kind of emergent properties. Now I didn't know anything that's what it's called or anything like that, but the idea that the sum is is greater than the individual parts um, was fascinating to me, and so I was like, "Well, okay, how far can we push this?" And so then I get to college, and I'm convinced that this is what I'm going to do, right? Because I'm good at it, um, and my, you know, I, I sort of emulate and and still revere my dad to this to this day. And I wanted to be like him. I wanted to do do what he did, and. Um, and at some point, though, he told me, he's like, you're actually better at this than I am. <laughs> you know, so you should think beyond, you know, think beyond whatever it is that I'm doing. What else? Padawan. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what, what else can you do with this stuff? And, and because I think, because I had a, a pretty good you know, aptitude for math, when I got to college, um, even though I wanted to do computer science, um, and I kept getting all of these physics and chemistry classes, I was actually also pretty good at that. Um, and and so then the idea became my first um, in the summer of my freshman year, um, my um, I got a summer research inter um, internship at um, Fermilab, um, which was a really really exciting summer. They were um, figure I think they had just they had run the experiment a couple of years before, but they had now analyzed it and they were pretty sure that they had discovered this new quark, and so. So I ended up on a team that was trying to write code to just sift through massive amounts of data and organize it in some sort of structured way. Working with this uh, staff scientist called um, Dr. Dave Ritchie um, at the time, and he was uh, you know, a Perl guru. It's this language, this scripting language called Perl, and he had written hundreds of thousands of lines of Perl. So here I am, you know, he's like, "Okay, Mr. Big Shot, you know C and all of that, but I'll show you how to actually organize data. It's far easier to do with these scripting languages." And and so that's kind of how I started. Uh, I learned Perl from him basically uh, that summer. And glossary, scripted language, scripting language. Ah, so. Um, so in computer parlance, you have different ways of giving the computer instructions. That's, you know, through the programming languages. And 
um, you know, you have languages, traditional programming languages like C and uh, Fortran and so forth. And they are called compiled languages, meaning that you write the code and then there is a, a, a computer program that comes and converts that directly into machine language so that the, so that it could run on the machine effectively. Scripting languages are a, a layer above that. So Python is sort of the um, most popular one these days, mm -hmm. but Perl was you know, an OG, one of the original ones. Uh, there are a level above that. They don't actually get compiled. They, as the, as the code is executed line by line, sort of the computer is interpreting it line by line. It's not this one big compiled machine code that's running. Uh, and because it's sort of not compiled at, at runtime, it's slower typically. Um, although Python is pretty fast these days because it has to be interpreted one line at a time. But it does, because it's not compiled code, it does allow you the flexibility to be more general in terms of the structure of the language. So mm -hmm. you can write it in sort of less regimented um, forms. You know, you don't need to know too much structure and you can just flop on it, right? right? And Python is a little bit more structured. But Perl at the time, yeah, anything goes. <laughs> you just have a, a general format and you can just write it. And so, which is great for a beginner. Um, and, and so I learned, I learned Perl that summer. And, um, that was my first, I think, introduction to using computing. Um, cause I knew how to make games. I knew how to, you know, blue, um, I knew that banks used this for stuff, but that was my first inkling that you could use it in science. And, and that, that then, germinated in my mind the idea that maybe, um, you know, we could start solving problems in physics and chemistry and then material science using computing. Mm -hmm. So you had this inkling yeah. and you decided to go to grad school. Yeah. Um, and uh, that involved a pretty big move. Yeah, I did. Um, <laughs> yeah. From Philadelphia um, to, uh, to LA. Well, so when were you in New York City then? So when I orig originally came up um, with my dad, so he was living in New York City at the time, um, and then um, and, re and then moved to Houston um, because he wanted a, a bigger yard. <laughs> Primarily, <laughs> <laughs> he was sick and tired of living in a uh, in a box in New York City, and, and sort of got himself this huge place in, in Houston. Um, so I didn't actually spend that much time in New York. My mom lived there, and so I was sort of in between uh, in in undergrad, basically. I'd spend most of my time in Philly, but then I would you know, go over to New York and, and hang out with my mom. Um, and that was that was interesting because, you know, obviously New York, you come for most people from the Caribbean, I would say. They whenever they say and, and they would say this in sort of local, uh, uh, we're going to America. <laughs> that really means New York City. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that you know, that is the kind of meeting point for so much of Caribbean culture, right? It's sort of New York and particularly meaning that you're going to go to Brooklyn. And so that's where my mom was. And so, um, so, so growing up there is not growing up there, but visiting there um, over the years. And then when I was in, in college, you, you kind of feel almost like you're back in, 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 um, in the Caribbean. You're going to get all the same foods. You get, you know, the people all kind of look the same and <laughs> they're walking around. They all sound the same. Was your, your undergraduate major was chemistry or chemistry? Physics? Yeah, it was chemistry. I had a, I had a double major in chemistry and math. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, I, but I probably took enough physics classes to get a minor in it. It just, but at that point, you know, I, I was really impatient, um, in that I wanted to go on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. I, I really did. And I, um, so I, I finished undergrad in three years, but then I took a year off. <laughs> um, much like, you know, when I came from high school, I more or less in Grenada, I took a year off, even though I, I did a, a year of high school um, in the U.S. A, ma a major, full major in math, yeah. full major in, in, in chemistry and uh an effective minor in <laughs> physics in three years. Yeah, I, I mean, okay. well, well <laughs> the, so, so, so the thing is, right, so my, my kind of gap year, I would call it, from high school in Grenada to, to college, um, when I did that year in, um, in, uh, in the U.S., I had fulfilled all of the requirements. The only thing that I had to do <laughs> was U.S. history, obviously. So I took, um, you know, AP history, as it turned out. Um, and then 
gym or physical education. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then I enrolled. I took a volleyball dancing class. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you applied your knowledge of uh, ballroom dancing and gym. Yeah. To uh, to Caltech, yeah. <laughs> so, but your but your gap year, did you spend that in the states or? I spent that in the states. Um, so so yeah. So I graduated and I knew I wanted to do the next thing. My second summer um, in 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 um, undergrad, um, I did a summer internship with um, at Caltech, and um, I, that was great. Um, and I kind of had a feeling that I wanted to go there for grad school. I. I you know, coming again, coming from the East Coast, the the culture in in the West was just so different and so foreign, but kind of familiar. I mean, and, and I'll explain that foreign in the sense that there was just there was Southern California just has a vibe to it that is unlike anywhere else, basically. But familiar in the sense that people are relatively laid back, and and that's kind of like an island vibe almost. And so I was like, okay, I really like this. It's it's different than than what I you know grew up with, but. It's also kind of familiar, even though it's Caltech. Even though it's Caltech, and it, it turns out that I had, um, by probably just dumb luck, but I ended up making some of the most amazing friends um, when I started grad school. One of whom was my um, grad school housemate, and he's now a professor in chemistry, Brian Zitt. Mm-hmm. And and it was. You know, so I had this kind of core group of uh, guys and, and 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 young ladies that we all hang out. You know, we all labored over the, the punishing classes and and the unforgiving, unrelenting teachers and the super smart undergrads who would take all of the grad courses and show us all up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I experienced that. <laughs> and. Um, but we formed this really, really neat community, and you know, and so that was that was my release valve, and you know, we did you know, a lot of hiking, we did a lot of outdoor stuff, we did you know a lot of partying, well, not a lot, but you know, enough to stay sane, you know, hanging out with UCLA folks, and so, so that was it was not it was intense, of course, and you know, there were my PhD advisor uh, Bill Goddard, and was my uh, summer research advisor when I was was there. And um, and he at the time had a huge group. Um, when I was there, and this is a theory group, mind you, we had about seventy people. Wow, group. this is incredible. And um, and somehow he you know, he he managed it. You know, it was, and um, but he had you know he if you know anything about Bill, he has this this sort of quirk where he. Um, he gets his sleep during the day. I will say, <laughs> at yeah, strange times sometimes. But um, a, an extraordinary mind, and sometimes he would come into the the office. I don't know how his wife Yvonne, who who I adore and and got to know um, really well, um, allowed this. But sometimes he would come in the office and it'd be four a.m. And uh, I think it, may, it might have been at the end of my first year. And I'm not sure why I was up at 4 a.m. still working, but he came in and and then on a Saturday, and then that ended up being our thing. We would you know, sort of have these early morning meetings all the time. Wow, and <laughs> and it was it was great because you know I, you know, I, to the to this day he just he's no he's no more about chemistry and, and physics than than I he's forgotten more uh, than I will ever know, but. Um, those those experiences were great because you know it was our time to kind of just talk in general about things. It wasn't the, the nitty gritty. Okay, how was this project going? It was much much larger uh, in scope, um, and and I had the advantage of coming in with um, a Department of Energy Computational Gra- um, Science Graduate Fellowship. So and so Bill says to me, he's like, "Well, you actually you know don't need to work on anything that I want you to work on because you're you know kind of self funded. So what would you like to work on? And and so so we we just ended up having a lot of fun. You know, we I, I kind of went from project to project, um, you know, kind of starting off in DNA nanotechnology, we worked with um, who someone is probably the pioneer in that field, um, Ned Seaman at NYU uh, recently passed away. Um, and he was now creating these little DNA nanorobots that you can 
sort of cars to walk along a sidewalk. And then the question is, what did the atomic structure of these things look like? Mm -hmm. And so that was my first project. What was your thesis title? My thesis title was um, um, something along the lines of first principles investigation of um, nanostructures. And, and very focused. Very focused, of <laughs> course. And, and, and that was because I was doing so many projects that I really didn't have a unified yeah. theme. It was... My thesis title is uh, Unconventional Approaches to Micro and Nanofabrication for Electronic and Optical Applications. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> well, you do what you want. Yeah, me, I was just, you know, we, we, we had this. Um, you know, the, pa the first, the early papers that come out of grad school kind of just spans, you know, soft materials, hard mm -hmm. materials, kind of hardcore chaos theory to sort of more, you know, um, just specific algorithms to solve specific problems. Did you know you wanted to continue in academia at the end of grad school? I did. Um, it was, um, and, and I think I knew that before I actually went to grad school. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, um, I I recognize that, you know, again, given my, my shortcomings in memory, <laughs> that, uh, that, you know, getting a conventional job was just never going to jive with me, I think. And, and I, I really enjoy, um, to this day, sort of one of, you know, one of the great joys is to the process of discovery, you know. And I remember quite, quite acutely, actually, this, this paper we did on graphite, and it was... It's, it to me, it's it's sort of the finest work I've ever done, at, at least um, when I was in grad school. And it really was just kind of mapping out the energy landscape. You know, it's like, oh, you have two sheets, and they're going to be sliding over each other, and they're going to have some configurations that are high energy and some that are low energy. And so, just mapping out as a function of x and y what that energy surface looks like. And so then I, I come up with this this huge data set and. You know, I'm thinking to myself, how do, how do I make sense of this? And so then I, I write a, a code um, to actually visualize it and visualize it, the, the potential energy surface. And, and I remember when I saw the first image of that and I was like, wow, like, mm -hmm. this is cool. And this is what I want to do going forward. I, I the, the process of discovery and, and kind of, you know, Asking questions of nature and then having 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 her answer back and say oh, this is this is what it is. So that's that's that was that's my foundational principle for everything we did. And then the typical next step in the trajectory is to do a postdoc yeah, at yeah. A, another top ten, top twenty school. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. And then uh, you probably in the United States. But that's not that's not what we did. No, at all. Um. So so part of I think part part of what really was amazing to me about Caltech was that you had, um, you know, grad students who were came from everywhere like I did. The undergrads are just incredible um, and weird um, in their own way. Um, but then you have these postdocs, um, some of whom are there for a short time, some of them who are longer. Um, but then there these really they are these independent people you know that they they come in with their their ideas they were working in someone's lab but they pretty much this kind of self-contained unit and that sort of stuff is encouraged to the fact that they have this class of research scientists as well that sort of are on campus and you know, are specialists in, in one thing or another and so i i kept running into so many of these people um and the postdocs in, in particular who were, you know, came from everywhere, as I said, and were just really, really talented. And one of them, um, Yu Sung Jung, um, was left, uh, he, he worked with Rudy Marcus, but then, um, at Caltech, but he also, um, interfaced with Bill quite a lot. And him and I ended up having lots of talks over beer about computational, you know, material science. And then, he had just got an offer to start his uh, own research lab at KAIST in Korea. And then, you know, so um, towards the end, again, my thesis is pretty scattered. There's, you know, there's a central unifying theme, but it's, it's just sort of applied to a whole bunch of different, um, uh, different things. And he says to me, you know what, I, I think that if you were to come and spend a little bit of time with me in Korea, that uh, this would be, you know, we could really focus on and kind of uh, this one project dealing with water desalination. I think we can make some really good headway there. I have, you know, and so I applied and got this um, 
postdoc fellowship from the NSF, an international fellowship to kind of to, to facilitate that. And so I went there thinking that I would spend, you know, nine months to a year. And and then a year and a half later, I, I'm starting to finally get, you know, feel my, my footing. Along the way, when I'm in Korea, I, I'm, you know, it's I'm able to kind of travel through uh, Asia and uh, all over Asia and um, even had a, a, a short uh about a week and a half in Russia, <laughs> and then you know, and then my uh, my girlfriend at the time, wife now, was living in London. Uh, so she was very upset at me uh, because she was like, "Well, first of all, you you leave you know L.A., which is hard enough; it's an eleven-hour flight, and then you go to Korea, and it's a thirteen-hour flight, and somewhere in between, you skipped over London, which is where I, <laughs> <laughs> which is where I am, and um, and and." And so then, because she was there, I ended up um, spending quite a bit of time um, traveling through Europe as well. And so, so that was that was fun. For an opportunity. Yeah. Are there differences to the way that science is done? And actually, maybe we should hold off on that until we find out where you went next. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a year and a half pass. I'm in Korea. I am um, loving life. You know, I, I sort of I spend some time in Japan um, while I'm there, and it's. To this day, if, if there was somewhere else that I would move from the U.S., it would be to Japan. I am absolutely, absolutely in love with that place. The, the people, the food, of course, but the people more so. And the, um, I would say the serenity and the, I, I just got the feeling in Japan that this was a, an ancient civilization that was confident in, in itself. And mm-hmm. was, you know, there was no need for the extravagance and the you know, loudness of, of America. It was very just at peace, you know, in, in harmony with, it, with itself. And, and, and that appeals to me at a very fundamental level. And so, so I really enjoyed you know, all of um, Southeast Asia and, and, you know, and Northern Asia. You know, I sort of went up and down with Hong Kong and then Vietnam and all, you know, just as many of those places as I could. And, um, and then, you know, it was, well, so what, what's next? And then I was thinking to myself, well, you know, I really want to do academia, um, preferably in the States. Um, I'm not opposed to Japan. <laughs> I'm not sure how that would work with them, but I'm not opposed to Japan. Um, so I came back and then, um, I, I was having these discussions with a professor up at Berkeley, who's actually not one of my collaborators now, uh, Rich Sakely. And he is really interested in water. He's sort of just fundamentally just interested in water as a, as a property. And, and I, I have a long standing interest in, in water as well, just, um, from a different lens, but as well. And so we were having this, this, this conversation and he says to me, you know what? I think you'd be really, really good to work with my collaborator, um, who is on the hill at Berkeley Lab. His name is David Prendergast. And so I talked to David and I would say probably over, 30 minutes, we, just, we were like, yeah, this is what we're going to do. And so then, so then, you know, I, I moved back to the States. I'm up at Berkeley, living in North Oakland. Um, and, you know, having such an extraordinary experience of being at the lab, which is, you know, it's, it's different than on, than on campus, um, but not really. So you sort of, you, you get this really extremely academic, um, sort of research enterprise that is housed in a government lab and, and in the material science division and, and at the molecular foundry in particular. And so, and so then David is, um, is a pioneer kind of using x-rays at computational x-rays science to look at materials. And so that's, that's, that's where I learned that mm-hmm. basically. How long were you there? Um, about three years, um, uh, as a postdoc. And then, um, it was like, well, uh, do you want to stay on for a little bit longer? And I was like, sure, this sounds good. So then I became a project scientist uh, there. Um, you know, kind of had my uh, own little ideas about what it is that I wanted to do and explored a whole bunch of projects in, in, with um, some really extremely talented people up there. Brett Helms mm-hmm. um, was a polymer um, a chemist there. We'll go ahead and tag him when we post that on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. No, that's amazing. Um, but, but, you know, the foundry is a special place in that everyone there is, in, in terms of nanoscience, material science, is, is right at the edge of what's, what's possible. 
and you know they have some of the most incredible equipment, but also the expertise I think is is, is phenomenal. And um, and just so my interactions with so many of, of those scientists there and and opened up my mind as to again you know what is possible with all of this. And then when it came time to apply for yeah. faculty positions, yeah. you came back to Southern California. I did. Yeah. Um, not uh, <laughs> not Pasadena, but San Diego. <laughs> And, Much better uh, in La Jolla. Than Pasadena. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, you had uh, a number of successes, including uh, co-lead on one of the independent research groups in the MERSEC, yeah. uh, which was recently awarded, yeah. and also very recently the NSF Career Award. Yeah. Congratulations! Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, what is your career award topic? If you don't, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the career awards uh, effectively. Uh, um, is focused on uh, what to me is one of my craziest idea. The crazy idea being, okay, we have batteries, we create them, we we you know they power our phones. Um, they're relatively simple electrochemical devices, three parts: an anode, a cathode, and you know something that prevents electrons from going between the two is called an electrolyte. Um, and you know. People, uh, we have incredible electrochemists and battery scientists down here at um, Experimentalist um, at UCSD. I would put our program up against anyone, and they are really creative in, in figuring out, you know, how to optimize these devices and new materials for these devices. Um, but if you talk to any one of them, they will tell you that there is still a, a, a lack of fundamental understanding about what really happens when um, an atom leaves one of the electrode, goes to the electrolyte, and then goes back to the other electrode. I mean, we know in general terms that this is what's happening, obviously, because the battery works. But how does it happen, right? I mean, so, um, and so that, that's what the, the career is about. It's about trying to use theory to actually do a virtual nano battery. We're gonna create a nano battery and put it on the computer and we're going to discharge it, and we're going to charge it, and we're going to see all of the chemistries that are happening um, at an you know, atomic level because we have control over that as theorists. We can you know, model the physics at that level uh, relatively straightforwardly. Can you define with the goal of differentiating the, these terms, theory, computation, <laughs> and modeling? Yeah, so it's, you know, if I use them into changeably. Um, if you're a purist, you probably scoff at that um, and say, oh, you know, these modelers are not real theorists. Um, so theory would be anything, uh, you know, almost uh, traditional theory would be pen and paper, writing on the equation, solving them and figuring out what are the ingredients um, of using that equation to apply to some real system. Simulation then would be the actual act of applying these equations. Um, to look at the material properties or and simulation and computation are more or less much the same, I would say. Um, those are used interchangeably and, and few people would, would scoff at that. Although these days there is almost a, 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 another line that gets drawn where, you know, you can have data science come in and, and that is less simulation and much more of analysis of simulation. And so sometimes that gets called computation as well. But, um, it's semantics for uh, for me, um, and then modeling would be okay. Um, you know, there is a system. How do I describe that system? Like, how do I set it up? Where do the atoms go? Um, and um, a lot of times, or not even the atoms. You know, you can describe it at different levels of rigor. You can say, well, I actually don't want to go to the nanoscale. I want to go to the mesoscale. I want to go to the macro scale, and and so. Those kinds of um, modeling approaches exist as well. Um, we focus um, a lot of what we do on kind of nanoscale and look at atoms and molecules and electrons. That's that's kind of where we've parked our bus. Where do the problems come from that you that you solve? Are they mostly uh, the trying to explain results that experimentalists get, mm -hmm. or are they? Uh, Generated inward, <laughs> yeah, yeah, inward, more uh, inward looking. And, and where does like computational methodology development come in? Yeah, so it's 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 a good question because I would say traditionally, um, 
there was, and probably still is, a deep suspicion of theory. <laughs> um, because again, as I said, you can control, um, you know, you get to play, to set up the system however you want. And you can apply whatever laws of physics you want to that system, right? I mean, as long as you can code it, you can apply it. And so for a long time, I think um, experimentalists have always thought of theory as and, and computation and simulation as toy models. You know, yeah, these guys are just coming up with idealized systems and they're trying to explore some exotic effect and that has no real sort of relationship to, to what's happening in reality because, you know, entropy is sort of the lifeblood of, of everything right now, right? It's sort of this chaotic thing that is happening and, and including those because it's it's almost an infinite dimensional space that you have to enumerate if you're going to get a realistic model. And so there's been a suspicion that theory is not there. And so that all of the stuff that comes out of simulations, basically, should be taken with a grain of salt. And so so for a long time, that was true. And there have been you know, developments along the way. And, and people have really focused on validating their simulations. And so... So then uh, computations became a tool for experimental val you know, validation by experiments. And then it's like, okay, it's validated. Now can you explain this experiment? And so that was the mode that it was in for a long time, still is today to, to a large extent. Um, the advent, though, of, of really sophisticated algorithms and really uh, an enormous increase in computing power, specifically these uh, supercomputing centers, much like uh, the San Diego supercomputing center that's uh, maybe half a mile from where we sit, um, has allowed now the consideration of much more extended systems, much more complicated systems, and has allowed us to sort of start putting in much more uh, relevant physics in these systems, so much more complicated models. To the point now that from the purpose of nanoengineering, I see very little difference in sort of the complexity that you can do on a computer and sort of the the scale and of the systems that you can real systems you can look at with experiments. So, so that has been a, a relatively recent convergence, I would say. And so now the role of theory be, um, and simulations morphs from simply explaining experiments to now making predictions. And it's actually, you know, good enough these days to actually make reliable predictions that then gets um, uh, backed up by, by future experiments. Which is actually the way that the chart in fifth grade of the scientific method is supposed <laughs> to go. It's supposed to work, right. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what's an example of a, uh, of a prediction that your work has made that you would like to see validated? Well, so I'll tell you one that that actually very recently, um, as you mentioned, we, we're, we're in the MERSEC um, which is um, meant to foster these three PI teams working on some uh, problem. And in our MERSEC, um, the Integrated Research Group, we're doing predictive assembly. And um, co I'm co-leading that with Andrea Tao um, here in, in nanoengineering. And the idea is to actually use theory, because there is an appreciation now that theory is mature enough to make reliable prediction. Use the predictions from theory to actually um, affect materials to um, tell you how to create materials. So our base idea is we have these building blocks and these building blocks can be nanoscale objects that are nanoparticles, proteins, metal organic frameworks, what have you, whatever it is. And by figuring out how to modify the surface and the interactions on the surface of these uh, building blocks, um, think of them as, as little Lego pieces, by figuring out how to, how to connect those Lego pieces together, we can create this massive, massive uh, macroscopic system by just um, engineering the, the individual components and having them self-assemble um, into larger scale materials. And, um, and so that, that's a pretty big idea, right? That you can, you know, you figure out from theory what the relevant interactions are and, and then, you know, optimize those uh, interactions on the computer and then someone would actually go and, and, and create these materials. And that part is obviously very hard as well. Thankfully, we have amazing synthetic um, um, folks and, and also characterization folks to tell you that this is what you actually have. And so one recent um, uh, uh, success, I would say, 
is in getting um, you know, these nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles, silver nanoparticles in general, when you buy them, um, there is always the issue of aggregation. They sort of, they, they come together because there are these huge kind of forces that kind of force them to come together. And to stabilize them to begin with, you need to have a polymer on the surface of them because otherwise they sort of are unstable and they disintegrate. So usually you coat them with some kind of polymer. Um, and that polymer usually just goes on the surface in a non-specific way. It just wraps around the surface and prevents effectively the, the, the core nanoparticle from disintegrating. For a long time, people have wondered, what if we could actually have polymers that only bind to very specific places on our nanoparticles? Because then, if they were only at very specific places, those represent the contact points between different nanoparticles so that you can assemble nanoparticles in very specific arrangements if you can control where the polymers go on the surface. How um, much do your collaborators need to know about computation in order to to do the inter yeah, interface, interface with you. me. Yeah. Not much, but thankfully, they're all incredibly smart that they know a lot of accounting. <laughs> <laughs> well, specifically, the grad students um, are aware um, of the methods. Um, some of them have tried them. I mean, density functional theory, which is sort of, I would say, the workhorse of quantum mechanics, you know, the, a way of describing electrons and the behavior of electrons. Um, created at UCSD, that, that whole theory. Um, in fact, the building um, that Walter Cohn and, um, and Sham, so Cohn Sham DFT, um, is now has been designated a historical landmark by the American Physical, Physics Society um, for the development of density. Power. I didn't realize that. And, um, and they, yeah, they're going to have a, a huge uh, dedication ceremony this summer uh, for that. Um, and would you say that UCSD is the pathway towards some abilities which some would consider to be unnatural? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a pretty fair statement. <laughs> um, yeah, um, the Miller-Urey experiment. Exactly. No, it's 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 it's, a, it's this. You know, again, much like much like Grenada, it's a small, you know, big island. I think UCSD is a is a young, really, really impactful and old place. You know, in that it's. There is so much that has come out in the last 60 years and, and so much that will come out in the next 10 years. It's just really exciting. That is such a wonderful place to end, but I'm not going to end. <laughs> oh, that would have been, been great. Um, I do have another question. Yeah. Uh, in the spirit of ideas in STEM ed, yeah. do you think we are doing a good enough job uh, to encourage people to do computational science in an undergraduate mm -hmm. curriculum. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like a lot of what you did was self-taught yeah. and like hard work in the background and like an interest in this. Yeah. But do we do we like, do we uh, f push it enough? No. Um, I'll expand that to say, do we um, have a particularly coherent vision, not of not just of promoting computational sciences, but also just Promoting sciences to underserved communities? No, um, we could. We'll, we have to. We we will and have to do better at that. Um, I think the um, the advent of sort of the data science institute here at UCSD is going to help in that. And, mm -hmm. and there's um, and that is a wonderful place for people who think about data science, not just in the computational kind of material science focus. But in the policy focus, um, in you know environmental and policy um, engineering focus, just all over the and computer science, of course, um, to come together and and solve really hard problems. That's going to help, um, but it's going to take a, a much more sustained effort from all of us. I think all of us that are in computational sciences to ensure that the undergrad curriculum reflects what is going to be more and more um, kind of the defining. I would say the defining um, one of the defining areas of science um, in, in the near future. Do you think computation in particular has a has a special role to play in closing achievement gaps? And yeah, absolutely, um, and 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 I, I like to think of it much the way that I think about the different sports that um, people get exposed to. Some of them are closed off, right? You need special equipment to, to do it, right? Um, but something like basketball, 
um, which is the second of football, you know, uh, European football, soccer, which is the one and two in terms of most popular sports. And they're, they're that way because you can just get a hoop and shoot mm-hmm. the ball or you, you just get a ball and shoot it into a net, right? And so, so insofar as they've been able to kind of democratize sports and make it accessible to everyone, I see computation in the same way because everyone has a computer now, right? And, um, and there are enough YouTube videos around that you can go and learn how to code um, uh, relatively straightforwardly, um, especially things like Python, which, is, which again is everywhere. And and so uh, I'll give you a, an example. I I, I did a, a podcast a couple of weeks ago and um, on nanotech in general, um, not even specifically on computational nanotech, just nanotech in general. And I have been getting um, emails from folks. I actually got an email from uh, two high school students in Maryland, uh, two uh, female high school students who says. I don't know anything about what you just talked about, but it sounded cool. Is there <laughs> any opportunities for us, someone like us? Yeah. And I was like, there's opportunities for all of you in That's the computational fantastic. sciences. Yeah. And you taught a summer school recently. I taught a summer school recently, and I'm going to have these two students in, in my summer school this, this year. Um, and, um, and the summer school was on sort of uh, predictive assembly, computational predictive assembly, and introducing the methods. Um, there are different lots of different ways that, that one can go about doing computer simulation. So just giving them broad um, strokes. And then specifically, each person had a project that they were going to work on. And we, we worked on how to implement computer, computation. These were primarily experimentals, experimentalists, incoming graduate students, um, and how to apply the computational sciences to, to help with their particular project. And so that was the feedback there was was amazing. And the students were so appreciative, I would say, of you know, someone not just assuming that they would not be interested. And it turns out that there is interest. Um, and so so presenting that material in a way that's accessible then becomes becomes paramount. And, and so so this, this second year will be much, much better, I think, as we work out the kinks. Wonderful. Yeah. How can people find information about that? And how can they find information about you and your work? Sure. Um, so this computational school is called RIMES, R-I-M-S-E. Um, it means something that I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but if you go to uh, mersec.ucsd.edu, that's M-R-S-E-C dot uh, U-C-S-D.edu, And under the um, education and outreach, they have the listing of the different summer schools. There are three different summer schools, one on silicon nanotechnology um, run by Mike Saylor, who is the director of the center, one on living materials run, run by John Podorsky, who is um, the co-lead on the other integrated research group, and one on predictive assembly that is run by myself and Andrea Tao. And, and students um, at all levels uh, can apply to attend the summer schools, can apply to our, our research um, programs for undergrads, and um, and come here and um, participate in in this really really um, exciting adventure, I would say, and new directions for materials research at UCSD. Where um, the the idea is that there are no ideas that we're going to throw out, and we're going to try um, to within these you know general frameworks of predictive assembly and living materials. Um, we are going to just have fun and, and try all kinds of interesting and crazy things and um, and just do good science, do good engineering, and um, allow the students the the space to to really explore um, all that uh, all that there is to to see in that space. Awesome. Yep. Todd Pascal, thank you so much for Thanks. joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, folks. Thanks for listening to Ideas in STEM Ed, a production of the Idea Engineering Student Center in the Jacobs School of Engineering at UC San Diego. This episode was edited and engineered by Sky Lee with theme music written and performed by John Viviani. Title art was created by Caitlin Wong. Special thanks to Sarah Eckerd for guest booking and marketing. The Idea Center works to promote community, success, and inclusion at all levels. To reach us for guest suggestions and other feedback, please send an email to ideadirector at eng.ucsd.edu. And to learn more about our programs, visit jacobsschool.ucsd.edu front slash idea. 
As a final note, the views expressed by me or the guests do not necessarily reflect those of the Idea Center, the Jacobs School of Engineering, or UC San Diego. See you next time.